Um, so, uh, top of the morning to you. <laughs> she said it in tiny rocks, wrong accent, but uh, welcome to uh, Dublin. Um, my name is Mike Bersal. I'm CEO and co founder of Profium, but also um, co founder of the Enarx project, which we'll be talking a bit about today. I hope this is the talk you're expecting. If it's not, you're in the wrong place. Um, this is also being live streamed and recorded, so hello to everyone um, in the future and elsewhere at the moment. Um, this is the abstract in case you missed it. So, what are we talking about? Um, we're going to talk about the problem we're addressing here, um, and it's really about isolation. And then we're going to talk about various PETs, um, not in a huge amount of detail, but just to give you a, a comparison. Um, talk about why open source is important, and then um, hopefully a live demo. So please have your mobile phones or uh, laptops uh, ready to participate in the live demo. If it doesn't work, um, it's Patrick's fault over there. He's right in the corner, and uh, he got it working this morning. So I'm um, fingers crossed, right, Patrick? Yeah, fine. Okay. And then hopefully some time for questions as well. So let me start with a story. Um, once upon a time, computing was simple. It was lovely and easy, and this is what it looked like. <clears throat> and then uh, the British came along, and. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, we messed it up uh, royally, so it's possibly unfortunate given where we are, but I uh, wrote these slides before then. So, um, and it's about tea. I know this is a, maybe a surprise to, to many of you, but it's about tea. Tea is always good. Uh, and cake. And there was a, uh, a, a chain of tea shops and cake shops called Lions in the UK. There aren't many left anymore, but there were. And uh, they had uh, logistics issues, and so they, uh, they commissioned computers back in the day, and LEO3 was one of theirs. I can't remember what it stands for, but it, it was that. And it kind of looked like this, or it's, it, certainly the front end looked like this. This is what uh, GUI used to look like. And they came up with this idea of multitasking, where more than one person could be using a computer at a time. There are some seats uh, here. Do please uh, find, come through and, and find places to sit. And ever since, people have been obsessed with sharing. Um, and in my view, this is a really bad thing, not only because sharing cake is terrible, um, but also sharing computing resources causes you some significant security issues. So the problem isn't really the computers, it's really the workloads. So what we want to think about here in security is isolation. Uh, and isolation can mean a whole bunch of things, but I'm going to focus on three things, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad. Um, Confidentiality, people can't see what you're doing. Integrity, they can't change with it. Availability, you can continue doing what you want. Now, generally, um, please come in. There's still a few seats over here. Do, do come in. Um, uh, generally, availability is easily observed, and we're not going to talk about that. You can generally see if your workload is running uh, in this sort of context. So we're not going to talk a huge amount about this. But there are three types of, of isolation, I think. One is workload from workload isolation. That's stopping one workload interfering with another. And VMs containers know how to do this. We've been doing this for quite a while. Um, the next is host from workload isolation. Again, we're pretty good at this with things like SE Linux or SetComp um, or you know, hypervisors and all those sorts of lovely things. However, workload from host isolation is much, much more difficult. And classical virtualization just doesn't allow you to do this because the hypervisor, whatever is doing uh, the sharing of, uh, of memory pages to applications, can just see what's going on. And there's not much you can do about it in the standard models. So PETs, uh, privacy enhancing technologies, um, look to solve some of these problems. Um, and here's a definition I found on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> Actually, I think it's OK in this, in this particular case. It's not too bad. I'm not going to read it all out. Um, but they're talking about um, fundamental data protection principles, minimizing data use, maximizing data security. I, I like that. I also like the empowering individuals. I don't think we always think enough about that. And those of us who work for corporates, I mean, I'm, <laughs> we're only 14 of us, but you know, I'm sure there are people who work for a lot, a lot larger companies. But I think this is an important thing we need to be thinking about as a community generally. I think it fits well with our open source ethos as well. So you can think of two sets of uh, privacy technologies. Um, one is, is hard, where there is no trusted third party. There's no one you trust to do stuff with your data. Um, and another is where, actually, there are certain people you can trust to do certain things, right? You, you can say, this corporation, this company, this organization is safe. Um, and we're going to be focusing on the ones on the left, which is, frankly, the harder problem and fits better with the isolation issues we were talking about before in sort of cloud computing and edge and on-prem as well, frankly. So um, this is a, 
uh, a picture that I lifted unashamedly, but with permission, um, from a, a white paper by the Confidential Computing Consortium, um, which kind of lists out some of the technologies. And we're going to talk about the ones in bold a little bit. Fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, and confidential computing. Because they're the ones you hear most about when we're talking about um, PETs generally. Um, at the bottom, you'll see some things which aren't confidential computing. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. If you're interested, we can talk about it. TPMs, uh, for instance, aren't. We're talking about general computing here, rather than just being able to run certain, uh, specific operations. Um, so we'll, we'll, we can come to that if we need to. I'm happy to take questions. So before we do that, I said I'd talk a little bit about open source. In my view, everything should be open source. Again, I don't think there's going to be many people disagreeing with that as a general principle here. Um, but in the security realm, there is a very well-known dictum, which is in the cryptography, you make the protocols open and the keys secret. Because the protocols are the things that are actually protecting what's going on, and they should be, um, everyone should be looking at those, auditing them, doing mathematical checks on them, all those sorts of things. We've seen some very, very interesting stuff in the, uh, in the well, I, I hate to call it post-quantum, post -quantum, uh, the, let's say, quantum-resistant or not-so-quantum-resistant protocol realm over the last few months, where uh, people have been trying to write uh, protocols or uh, primitives which they hope will be resistant to uh, quantum computers only to discover that standard laptops without quantum computing can break them in under, a, under an hour in some cases. So this is a really important thing. We need to make this stuff open. <clears throat> and open source security, um, there's a couple of things. It's not just the, the protocol, but it's also the implementation. Right? So you want, let, let's give the example of elliptic curve cryptography or RSA. Not only the protocols that you're, and the primitives that you're implementing open source, but you want to make sure that your actual implementation is open source too. Because it's very easy to mess up an implementation of crypto. I know. Um, uh, they say that anyone can design a, uh, a crypto protocol that they can't break. I can also tell you that anyone can implement a uh, crypto protocol they can't break, which other people can. So you need to do this very carefully, and you want it to be open. This allows people to audit, do many eyes, put quick fixes in. Although, just a quick thing here. Does everyone know about the many eyes principle? Just in case you don't, the, there's a, it's sometimes known as Linus's rule, I think, but it's, it, you hear it in a number of places in the open source world. With enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And it's kind of true, but the problem with security in particular is there aren't that many eyes with, you know, peop, belonging to people with this deep security knowledge to be able to look at these things, really take them apart. Uh, and some of those people are, d are employed by people who don't want them to be doing this. So many eyes only works if we as a community sponsor and employ people to be doing this work. I believe really, really strongly in that. Um, so the, the other thing about um, open source is commercialization can be difficult. If you're trying to create an open source product, open source company around, um, around security uh, and it's open source, it can be tricky. I know that. We're doing it right now. It can, but it can be done. Uh, lots of people to talk to about, uh, it, about this in this, uh, this conference. So let's, uh, let's carry on a bit. So I want to briefly talk about, uh, about the three things on, on my list. The first one is, is fully homomorphic encryption. Fully homomorphic encryption is magic. Um, if you're not a mathematician. I'm not a mathematician. It is hence mag magic as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's some very, very clever mathematical principles being used to allow you to, to do operations, mathematical operations, on data whilst it stays encrypted all of the time. So you, you encrypt stuff with a, a particular key, and then you can do operations on it without having to decrypt, out, decrypt it, and stuff comes out the, uh, at the other end. Absolutely amazing. You need to design your workload if you're going to be doing that very, very carefully because there's only certain operations you can do and only certain ways you can run it. And the performance, um, to use a technical term, sucks um, in most use cases. Until recently, you couldn't do division with fully homomorphic encryption. It's at that sort of level of complexity. Um, Many of the implementations of fully homomorphic encryption are entirely closed source. 
Google, any Google people here today? Um, well, if there are, if there aren't, it's fine. I'm just going to say good things about you. Um, Google has done some great work actually in open sourcing some of this work, and there are other people as well. But you'll find a lot of money out there and a lot of closed source stuff, which always makes me just worried from a security point of view. But it is amazing stuff and, and uh, just kind of seems to work. The next one is secure multi party computation, or MPC, or sometimes just MPC. Um, it's difficult to define this because actually there are lots of different techniques which kind of fit in this bucket. Um, uh, a lot of them are, are, are mathematics based um, and there's things like zero knowledge proofs which can, which can fit in this sort of bucket as well. Um, but again, you can't, this isn't about general computers, it's about taking a particular problem, let's say a voting problem, um, a number of uh, MPC uh, areas around, uh, use cases around voting, anonymized or pseudonymized voting, um, or you're looking at pseudonymized data and applying it, writing your application and running it. Um, so in some cases that it's fairly fast, sometimes it's fairly slow, but quite difficult to generalize. Um, if there are experts in, in the room about this, I'm sorry to have um, glossed over some of the very clever things going on, but honestly, it's, it's a very large field. So the thing I know most about and what we're doing at Profian and the NARCS project is trusted execution environments. Um, hands up who's heard of SGX or of SEV or confidential. Okay, so most people. So trusted execution environments are basically uh, capabilities of, of CPUs, currently CPUs. We expect to see them in GPUs and other places as well soon. In fact, Nokia's announced some stuff around that already, which allow you to uh, encrypt memory pages of applications in use at the CPU level, which means that even if you've got kernel access or hypervisor access or admin access or whatever, or even access to the, the physical hardware um, to, the, you know, to the buses, etc., you can't look in. Again, it's magic, but it's hardware magic rather than mathematical magic as far as I'm concerned. Um, this does mean that you can't run these sorts of workloads, workloads designed for confidential computing on any old chip. You do need specific chips, um, but these are becoming pretty much available in, you know, you can go to many of the clouds these days. You can buy machines off the shelf with these chips, uh, the Epic chips from AMD um, and, uh, is it the no, sorry, it's the Ep Epics are the Intel ones. Uh, uh, what they call the AMD ones. I, I, it's, it's Milan and onwards, basically, for uh, uh, for our friends at AMD and Icelake and onwards, uh, the ones that we support um, for for Intel. But the nice thing is you can run generalized workloads. You don't need to be you know doing these uh, rewriting your applications fully. You can take an existing workload. Um, and hopefully with no or small changes, run it uh, in these contexts. So I want to do a bit of a comparison here. So on the left-hand side, we've got standard virtualization, right? So, you know, containers and, and VMs and all those sorts of things. On the right, we've got the other things. Uh, and the first one, obviously, is that you can't, um, there's, it's, it's a bigger chart. Don't take pictures now because it's going to be a lot, there are going to be more, more lines. Okay. Um, so you can't do, do confidential computing on, on all chips. But at the bottom, you know, we'll see data confidentiality is what we're trying to, to meet here, and that is provided by the lower level. Now, if we think back, however, to uh, one of my first slides, I talked about isolation. I talked about the CIA triad, right? So this is data confidentiality, and you could ask the question, what about data integrity? And this is where start, things start getting interesting because data integrity is not guaranteed by um, fully homomorphic encryption and not necessarily by multi-party computation either. It is by confidential computing. Next is the workload itself. What if you care about the workload's um, uh, confidentiality and its integrity? And uh, I put this, I've realized I've put this the wrong way around on the right. It should be, uh, the green one should be, it uh, depends on implementation, should be on uh, confidenti confidentiality uh, for the workload there. I'll change that in the slides that we put out. I do apologize. Do apologize. Um, so basically, when you have a workload, there are times when you care about the workload. Maybe it's a, a risk management system, 
or maybe it's an AI model you've been putting together. And in fact, the workload in it itself is more, uh, more confidential than the data that's running in. If you're doing a, a thing to decide whether to buy stock, for instance, everyone has the same data going in, which is you know, prices of stock. Everyone sees the data going out, which is you bought stock or you haven't, but it's actually the decision-making process, the workload itself, which you want to make sure is confidential. And of course, you want to make sure that no one can mess with it, so the integrity is also important. So that's another thing that, uh, conf that um, confidential computing can provide. And the last thing is attestation. Attestation is one of those terms which is, uh, <clears throat> sounds very complex and is actually very, very easy. It's difficult to do, but it's easy to explain. Attestation is a proof that what you're running is what you think you're running. So if I go to you gentlemen in the front row and I say, please put this workload in a trusted execu execution environment, and you say, yeah, I've done that. I say, well, um, the whole reason I gave it to you was so that you couldn't look at it, and you're just telling me you've done it. How, do I, how can I trust that? So trusted execution allows him to give me a proof which he can't mess with which allows me to check that's the case. So for Intel SGX and uh, AMD SEV and future things, so ARM, CCA, they've talked about, there's other ones, TDX and Intel, etc. Part of what confidential computing involves is a, uh, is a cryptographic proof provided by the CPU, which can be checked by a third party. And that's really important. Because if, let's say you're running on Azure or GCP or uh, Equinix or OVH, and you say to them, um, prove that you're running what, what I think you're running, and they say, yes, I am, then it's kind of like they're marking their own homework, right? That you've kind of missed the point. So you need a trusted third party to be doing that. So uh, apart from the fact that I messed up those two lines, this is the, uh, this is the picture that you uh, probably want to take, but I will, um, I will put an updated version of that. So what I'm going to talk now a bit about is, uh, is NARCs. NARCs is a confidential computing project. Uh, oh, GitHub star, please, obviously, we like those. We're at 190 this morning. If we get to 900 or even 1,000, I should be very, very pleased. Um, but it's a completely open source project, and it is part of the, um, uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium. Let me talk a bit about it. So the first thing is we support both SGX and, AE, uh, and AMD's SEV. And what we allow you to do is to take a workload and run it on either of those. Now, you'd think that's kind of easy because it's just x86, right? But it turns out the way that they have implemented uh, confidential computing is almost completely different um, between the two. Everything we do is completely open source. It's all written in Rust with a little bit of assembly language right at the bottom because we're talking syscalls. Uh, and we are very careful about which bits of of unsafe code we have because Rust is generally safe. So we restrict very carefully the assembly pieces to uh, an unsafe. I should be very clear that I've written none of this code. They won't let me write code anymore. Uh, Roman has, so you can put your yeah, wave, Roman. Yeah, Roman has, so there we go. And we provide, a, we, the runtime is WebAssembly. So that means that, web is, who knows about WebAssembly? OK, a few people. It started off in browsers to kind of do JavaScript right. But um, it's moved to, to server. WASI is the WebAssembly uh, systems interface. And uh, basically, it's a very good fit for the sort of stuff we're, we're uh, trying to do, server-based, maybe microservices, or those type of use cases. So the thing about WebAssembly is it provides exactly the same runtime across all of these different um, uh, platforms. So whether you're running uh, on Intel SGX, uh, AMD's SEV, ARM Realms, TDX from uh, from Intel when that comes along, even though some are little endian, some big endian, it's exactly the same executable. And this is really helpful when we're talking about integrity and checking that what you think is running is what you're running, right? Because you can prove that it's the same thing. So we, we provide WebAssembly to do that. And we provide the attestation and that application integrity that I talked about uh, uh, and confidentiality that I talked about out of the box. So it's, we believe that you really need this to be, um, to be doing things properly, to be doing confidential computing properly. We are a Linux Foundation project. We were the first Linux Foundation project to be accepted, well, first project to be accepted by the Confidential Computing Consortium by about half an hour. Um, so we win over Microsoft's OE SDK. Um, but that means that uh, Profion, of which uh, I'm 
I'm the CEO. We're the custodian, we like to think of it. We don't own it. It is absolutely a Linux Foundation uh, project, which we think is the right way to be doing these things. So yay, go the Linux Foundation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so what I'm going to do now, um, demo God's willing, is an actual demo. So wish me luck. And let's see if we can make this work. So you can all try this yourselves. Don't do it now because I'm going to show you something else first. Let me um, put on Do Not Disturb. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, connect to an actual, uh, uh, put, put an application into a trusted execution environment. Okay. Um, so I'm going to select a platform. The I know that we have we have some problems with the uh, with the display. I'm sorry about that, but you should be able to see most of the things. Um, and I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose AMD. Okay, doesn't make a difference. It'll work, right, um, Patrick? Yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's nodding. That's good. Okay. Oh, so the first thing I need to do is log in. So I'm going to log in. Uh, it's just a, a GitHub login. As long as you've got a GitHub login, you're good to go. This is how we track what's going on. Uh, we don't want people doing, you know, Bitcoin mining on our on our platforms. <laughs> Nothing else, right? So it's that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to deploy uh, this thing here. And this is a, uh, a WASM, a WebAssembly um, application written in Rust. Um, if you want to just upload your own WebAssembly, um, you can do that. Or we've got a whole bunch of examples that you can try. They're all open source. And then you can load them into our registry, which is called the Drawbridge, and keep practicing with them and, and see how they work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We really encourage you to do that. Um, I won't go through that in this uh, demo. We don't have the time, but let's do that. So. I'm going to deploy this. So what is going on here is we've we've taken this WebAssembly, we've asked um, the uh, the AMD box, uh, which is in Equinix, to start up a workload. Okay, and um, there's a link here, which I'm going to follow. Um, and what's going on here is that we present. Uh, a, a certificate, but this is not a certificate which has been signed by uh, any of the, the browsers. So don't be surprised you see this. This is just for testing. Production environment would look different. But I'm going to I'm going to accept it for now. Uh, I'm going to accept the risk and continue. And uh, Cryptal is basically a, a Wordle clone, but written in WebAssembly and deployed to a trusted execution environment. So um, let's take a guess at what the word might be. I honestly don't know what it is. It is random. It's not NARCs. OK, so what I'm going to encourage you to do is to get your phones out and have a go at this as well right now, because you can, you can connect to this thing, which is running a trusted execution environment. The, the URL you need is HTTPS, colon, slash, slash, SNP dot try dot NRX dot Profian dot I, I, you know what, I'm going to make this uh, bigger somehow. Let me just, uh, uh, let's try, I'll do one too. Can I make that big? Anyone know how to make that bigger? What if I do this? That doesn't work either. Okay, so uh, where do we get to? SNP try enox profian dot cloud colon 33437. I'll say it again slowly. HTTPS colon slash slash SNP dot try dot NRX dot Profian dot cloud colon three three four three seven. Oh, that's very clever. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to pass that around. Just pass, pass your machine around and hope no one steals it. <laughs> he is a security guy. He didn't fall for that. Um, Uh, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's try. Let's try that, shall we? Uh, not calc. Um, let's do writer. That's fine. Uh, okay. There we go. That's better, isn't it? Good. Good thinking by the Finnish gentleman at the back. I'm guessing. There we go. That's it. Kitos. That's one of my three words of, uh, of Finnish, everyone. I used to know how to order reindeer and beer in Finnish. Those are the only other things that are useful. There's lots of other good things in Finland, to be clear. But. 
Uh, so hopefully, uh, and you will of course need to, uh, oh, Gina, should I go back to that? You will of course need to, um, to accept the uh, certificate, but hopefully you can, you can connect. Have, have people, anyone actually managed to connect to the Wordle Chrome? Clone. Yeah, excellent. Uh, let me know if you, uh, if you guess, the que guess the actual thing, but it doesn't really make a difference. The point is that this is a, an application written in Rust, compiled to WebAssembly, and uh, you, can, you can go and you can do this yourself. Try.enux.dev anytime you want. Okay? And we encourage you to do so. The fact that it is actually working suggests that Demogos has smiled on me, and I, um, the coffee that I bought for Patrick this morning was a, the, what needed to happen. So, um, right, whilst the people are playing with that, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. 10, even 15 minutes for questions, is it? Yeah. Excellent. So, um, I've, I've, let me just finally finish off the last couple of slides whilst people are playing with that. And. Um, Oh yes, I have a, a book out which talks about many of these things. Um, it's called Trusted Compute Systems in the Cloud, published by Wiley in 2021. If you're interested in this sort of stuff, kind of from first principles, um, and you need a way to get sleep at night, then uh, feel free to uh, to get hold of this. Um, Enarchs.dev is where where you'll find this. Um, Profian.com, and that's my LinkedIn. If anyone wants to do that. In the meantime. Um, I'm open for questions, please. Uh, and if there's any difficult questions, I'll get Roman to answer them or, or Patrick, so that's great. Please. Excellent, thank you. Well, I'm not a trusted computing as expert either, but uh, as far as I know, uh, the computing, the way you compute must be um, very rigid when it comes to, let's say, branches and you know conditions and whatever because it's uh, it's a subject to side side channel attack right so how do you help with this with your api or okay so the the, the 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 question said was that this gentleman said uh so it's Macliff? Maciej. Maciej, sorry um saying that he's not a trusted uh, computing expert himself but as far as he's aware you need to be careful with things like branching etc um when you're doing these things so that depends partly on what you're doing. That's certainly very true of homomorphic encryption, for instance. Um, less true of uh, confidential computing, um, although there are some mitigations that you, you, you can be doing. It's not something we've... Um, side channel attacks are a concern in all of these use cases, of course, right? Um, there are more concerns actually on things like constant time crypto, which is something that we're, we're working on um, in, in the implementations that we're doing. We haven't implemented it yet, but we've... We've designed it as something we can do. Um, the again, one of the things that we do is we allow we allow you to make sure that your um, application is confidential from the host, so they can't tell what you're doing, which means it's much more difficult for them, of course, to be guessing what you're doing, particularly if it's a standard computing uh, piece of computing. Uh, uh, application. So uh, yes, there are trickinesses there. I think it's generally less of a problem in the confidential computing world, and particularly again, if you're taking, if if you say that you want to make sure that what you're doing is confidential as well. Um, but it's, it, there's a lot of research going on this area, and um, yeah, uh, keep an eye on it. Yeah, because these extensions that you mentioned, they are. Uh, this is just like a separate execution mode within the general purpose CPU, right? So he's saying that, that the extensions to the CPU is, is basically a different set of uh, execution modes within the standard CPU. Right. Yes, exactly how they're implemented depends very much on, uh, on, on the chip manufacturer. Because there are others when they just provide a separate chip, right? Yeah, so other, other chips. So ARM had a mode called Trust Zone, which is right. different again. So that doesn't meet the Trust Zone on its own, doesn't meet the requirements for being a trust execution environment on its own, although it is possible to build one, um, Opti does something a bit like that. We chose not to support it because of a number of um, restrictions on what we were looking to do. And we spoke to Arm about it, and they said, yeah, we'll actually work, wait for the CCA realm stuff, and that's why we chose to do that. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone else, please? Uh, gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, this is a tricky one. So a tricky one, OK. Yeah. Do you know if Intel will allow 
So, so the, the, the question is, um, for uh, Intel SGX, we rely on closed source, uh, it's basically microcode from, uh, from Intel to provide some of the capabilities. Uh, do I know if Intel uh, will allow other people to provide that microcode? My answer to that question is I don't know. And even if I did, it would be under NDA. Um, <laughs> I think it's worth talking to Intel about this. Uh, one thing I can say is I hardly recommend that all chip manufacturers who are providing this open source all of it all the way down to the hardware if at all possible, but certainly at the microcode level. And we are seeing that, I think, from ARM, for instance. Um, so I hardly recommend anyone um, working for these chip people or if they have any um, say with them to encourage more open source down to the firmware level. I think it's really important um, for us to be able to do this. I should be clear that the attestation um, measurements that we do always do um, do cryptographic measurements of both the hardware and that firmware and that microcode on all mi microcode on all platforms. So we can be sure it is the right stuff, but we can't be sure exactly what's in it because it's uh, generally closed source. Very good point. There's another question towards the front here. Yes. Yeah, OK, great, great question. So example of how attestation works. So I've, I kind of glossed over that because I wanted to talk about the main platform rather than the, the broader thing. So Profian, we are a, a commercial company and we're providing attestation SaaS services as part of what we do. So the, the model we, uh, we do is that um, it works like this. There are three pieces. There is the NARCS runtime, which actually sits on the host. OK, and that's the bit that sets up the trusted execution environment. There is something, uh, oh yeah, we call that a keep. We, are, uh, we use castle metaphors, and the keep is the sort of central part of a castle, the safest place, right? Um, we provide an attestation service called um, the, the steward, which is the person who hands out the keys in the castle. And then we have a, uh, a registry, think Docker Hub type, type thing, called the drawbridge. And that is where you put your applications. They're encrypted, so we can't see them, other people can't see them. Um, so that's the drawbridge, and that's where things are. So first thing you do is you, you put your application in there. Okay? You then contact um, the, uh, the host um, by running the NARCS binary. You might have got it there using a container. You might have used whatever it is, but you've, you've got it there. It might just be a, uh, an OS-provided package. But you, you start it up with a slug, with basically a URI, pointing at a drawbridge instance and the particular application in that, and the cryptographic hash which is associated with that. So as NARC's runtime starts up, it knows what to load. But it doesn't load it yet. It starts up a trusted execution environment and puts part of itself into that, including the WebAssembly runtime. Okay, so we now have a trusted execution environment, whether it's SGX or SEV or in the future realms or whatever it may be. So we have that running. Okay, It then asks the OS for an attestation measurement. You're going to shout at me if I get this wrong, aren't you, Roman? Please do. Um, so it asks it for an attestation measurement. That is provided uh, as a signed certificate chain, basically, with some information as well, to the, uh, to the keep. The keep then contacts the steward, the attestation SaaS service, with a CSR, with a certificate signing request, okay, which includes that attestation measurement and that URI, that slug. Okay? So it then goes to the, to, to the SaaS service, the steward. The steward checks it against known good um, versions of the keep, a, a chip, uh, manufacturer information, a whole bunch of stuff, right? So it checks that what's in there is what should be in there, and what it provided it is what it should have provided it. If that is good, it signs that certificate and sends it back to the keep. The keep then sends that certificate as part of an HTTPS or TLS um, uh, communication to the drawbridge. The drawbridge uses the information in that, A, that it was correctly signed and therefore is running in a keep, and B, that it is a, an application that it knows about, to release that application over that encrypted link to the keep. The keep is then, then deploys that application. So we now know that we have the keep running 
with the application we want and that we've proved that what it is. Now the, the final piece of cleverness here is that we use that same certificate for all further communications, transparently encrypting network comms. Which means that if you're another application or another component of an application talking to that application in the keep, you know two things about it. You know one, that it is running in a keep because it's been signed by the attestation service. And two, you know the application that you're talking to is the application you thought it was. So you can, you've got sort of really good high levels of assurance about what you're talking to and the safety, confidentiality and integrity of that. So that's kind of the, 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 the quick story, but that's, that's what we're about. Um, we can run that in sort of uh, air gap mode, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, it's a, these are SaaS services. And if you're a large company, you'd probably have your own drawbridge instance, but we'd be providing the, uh, the SaaS service. Got another, I think, four minutes do we have? Five minutes. More questions, please. I'm loving this. The question was, what's on the critical path between now and large-scale adoption? Um, well, we moved to um, minimal viable product last month, so customers. <laughs> uh, so there's a number of things, I guess. So um, we are implementing a multi-threading, uh, which isn't there at the moment. Um, some of the networking uh, is, is getting nicer and easier to use. Um, there's some crypto implementations that we want to make sure are tighter in the, uh, in the keeps themselves. Um, WebAssembly needs, needs to keep getting more mature, but it's doing very well there. Um, there's another thing which uh, was an issue uh, and isn't anymore, and that's availability of the chips. They're just out there now. You can get hold of them pretty easily. Oh, sorry. Get hold of them pretty easily, um, both in clouds or you can buy, uh, buy them for yourself. Uh, final one is uh, upstreaming. So the SGX um, kernel pieces went in in 520 so uh, they need to be I mean we can all get hold of them but, but unless you know we need to get those into the uh, into the distros obviously and the SEV uh, stuff is not all upstreamed we have if you want to be running this yourself at the moment then we have kernel patches and, and compile kernels you can use to do that um, but we're working with the various people to make sure that all that stuff get uh, gets upstream we we have you know kernel maintained on the on, on the team uh, who's working with those sorts of things. So I think those are the main things. Anything else I've missed? I, I think those are the, probably the, the things. It runs now. You can, you can play with it now. You can just do it. And please, please do. And there's an, you're, if you delve further back into uh, nux.dev and, oh, yeah, please give us a star, um, you'll see that there's um, lots of examples in different languages that you can play with. Uh, this is probably the last question, I think. Let's... Uh, Do, do, or does everything need to be um, coded in WebAssembly? About three people in the world code in WebAssembly. It's, 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 it's a bytecode representation, basically. The answer is you code it in almost any language you want. And we have examples, C, C++, JavaScript, TypeScript, Assembly Script, um, Rust, Go, Python, blah. And you compile it. And for most of those uh, languages, it's very easy to compile. Um, it, there are some quite a bit of work, and we're working with Upstream on those for some of them as well. Um, but no, you can write in many different languages, compile to WebAssembly, and you're good to go. And you'll find instruction, instructions on nux.dev. So, oh, one, very, very quick question. Go, 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 quick, quick. So, uh, can you give an example of kind of workload that runs on nux? Uh, yeah, example of workload that runs on nux. Um, it's early days still, but... Um, the sort of things we, we, we have customers looking at is um, if they've got a large, a, a large stack, a microservice, and their particular parts that are dealing with, for instance, PII, personally identifiable information, or credit cards, or uh, risk management, or fraud management, or those sorts of things, running them uh, in, in those sorts of use cases is a good one. There are a number, actually, one thing I should have talked about is that actually some really interesting, fully homomorphic encryption and uh, multi-party computation use cases which are really complementary and work really really well with confidential computing and we're definitely talking about those sorts of things so things like research uh, pharmaceutical research where they're taking lots of patient data but the patient data can't be given to them 
we can do those sorts of things as well. That's some really exciting stuff. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Had great, great time, great questions. Any questions, find me LinkedIn, find me later on, find me around the conference, and uh, thanks for your time.